name's Stefan Moll. I'm a hematologist and clinical researcher and educator at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I'm here today to answer any pressing questions that you may have about COVID-19 vaccination, particularly with the question of risk for thrombosis. These are rare blood clots and should not sway people away from getting the vaccinations that we have in the United States with the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. And I'm going to take reference to these rare blood clots in a minute, but I do want to get the main message out first, uh, if I may, um, that with the two vaccines we have available, the Moderna and the Pfizer, those are not known to increase the risk for blood clots, either the general DVT and PE, i.e. blood clots in the legs or in the lung, um, nor the rare blood clots that have been observed with the vaccine in Europe or the Johnson Johnson vaccine that has been passed for the time being. We'll get back to that. But with the currently available vaccines, even people who have had a blood clot or people who are on blood thinners are not at increased risk for blood clots. So there's no concern and people should get the vaccine and not hold off for any reason. That's the key message I think regarding the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that's also called the Janssen vaccine. So that's a medically uh, relevant story, but for the general public clinically not really that relevant because the the vaccine has been paused and is not available at the moment. Um, but the observation has been in the last few weeks in Europe with the so-called AstraZeneca vaccine, which is not available in the United States. There have been a number of unusual clots and those are clots around the brain called cerebral and sinus vein thrombosis and some rare uh, clots around in the abdomen called splanchnic vein thrombosis or portal or splenic vein thrombosis, mesenteric vein thrombosis. Now, there have been a, f a number of cases in Europe, but overall, it's still a relatively rare occurrence. But the unusual thing about these clots have been, has been that not only are they in unusual locations, but are they are also associated with a decrease in blood platelets. And it's an immune phenomenon that has, has been described and more clearly identified now, where the immune system of certain patients makes antibodies that activate platelets that leads to a lowering of the platelets, but the activation of platelets also leads to blood clots. Now, the interesting thing and in the um, initially uh, upsetting and alerting news was that in the United States, in the last week, there have been six patients who developed a similar picture. Um, all six had a cerebral and sinus vein thrombosis. All six had low platelets. And this was with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the Janssen vaccine. It has not been observed with the other two, the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. But that led to a temporary halting of using the Johnson & Johnson vaccine until it's further clear how commonly does this occur, who's at risk for it, and how should we deal with this situation. Now, this is of some concern for the patients who have had the Johnson Johnson vaccine in the last few weeks, because the observation has been in Europe, as well as with these six cases, that these blood clots happen within two weeks of having received the vaccine. So within 14 days. Now, if somebody has had the Johnson Johnson vaccine more than two weeks or more than, let's just even say for safety, more than four weeks ago, um, it's not expected that the Johnson Johnson vaccine would cause any problems in those people. But if people have, the, have received the vaccine within the last, let's say four weeks or more accurately in the last two weeks, then there is some risk for these unusual clots, but the risk is very, very small given the millions of people that have been vaccinated.
the typical symptom of a cerebral and sinus vein thrombosis, a clot around the brain, is a headache. And then there can be symptoms with a headache, such as uh, neurological symptoms, such as vision disturbances, vision loss, or neurological symptoms similar to a stroke, a weakness on one side or the other, or language difficulties that one cannot speak or uh, has a, a garbled speech. Um, those would be symptoms that are noteworthy to the patient and the family. It's not just a mild or moderate headache. It would be something that's unusual, maybe the worst headache ever. But if people are concerned, they should, certainly should talk to their physician and be evaluated for it. Those symptoms, most likely something like pronounced nausea, pronounced unusual vomiting, uh, maybe uh, diarrhea that's really out of the ordinary. The patient would typically know something is, this is just not how I typically feel. And then certainly they should reach out to their physician and be evaluated. Now, it may well be that some people develop also the more usual clots, the deep vein thrombosis, the blood clot in the leg, or a pulmonary embolism, a clot in the lung. But that's, it's not clear, that's it's not been well studied, neither in Europe nor here. Does it occur? Is that really how this disorder, this Johnson Johnson or AstraZeneca associated disorder happens? Um, but certainly if a new clot happened in the legs and the lung within four weeks of the Johnson Johnson vaccine, it's worthwhile asking, was this maybe due to the Johnson Johnson vaccine? And if somebody presents with such a DVT and PE, the first step for the emergency room physician or general practitioner is to ask about the vaccine. Have you received this in the last four weeks? And then to obtain what's called a CBC or blood count to look whether there are lowered platelets because this disorder is presenting as low platelets plus a blood clot. If it's only a blood clot with normal platelets, that's not this disorder associated with the vaccine. It is safe to get one of the two vaccines that we have in the United States, currently Moderna or Pfizer. There's no increased risk in anybody, including the ones who have a history of DVT or PE or who are on anticoagulation. There's no increased risk for blood clots. Now, having said that, there may be some confusion or concern in people because we know if you develop COVID or if somebody, anybody develops COVID, COVID-19 has been associated with blood clots. Um, and particularly the people who are in the hospital who are sick or in the intensive care unit. Um, and that was a significant concern, particularly last year when COVID-19 first uh, came about. And in the hospital, we are routinely given blood thinners to prevent blood clots but that's a COVID-19 infection. The COVID-19 vaccine is not associated with blood clots. In general, yes. However, um, the vaccine does activate the immune system. That's what the vaccine is meant to do, that you produce antibodies against uh, the virus. And a few months ago, you may remember there was a case in Florida where a physician, a gynecologist, developed what's called immune thrombocytopenic purpura, ITP, which is due to the immune system making antibodies that attack platelets, that lower the platelets, and then lead to bleeding. So an activation of the immune system seems to occur in a few people. So yes, we do think about that. Uh, and particularly as a hematologist, I think about it when I follow patients who have established ITP, immune thrombocytopenic purpura, 
because that happens outside of the immunizations. So if those patients get the immunization, there's a little bit of an increased concern or um, need to observe, could they develop a worsening of their thrombocytopenia or reactivation of the ITP? So a similar thought process would, I would expect, occur with a rheumatologist who follows somebody with uh, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, or the gastroenterologist who follows somebody with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, et cetera. Often those people are on certain medications, their disease is under control, but certainly those individuals should talk to their rheumatologist or respective gastroenterologist, in the case of ITP, to the hematologist, which I do. And then what we've done in some ITP patients is we get blood counts as CBC every so often after the immunization, such as five days later, 10 days later, and then maybe again um, another five days later, because the immune response would be expected to occur in the first week to two weeks. So if there's a drop in platelets or maybe a reactivation of an immune process, you would expect that would happen relatively soon after the immunization. But in general, people with immune disorders should strongly think about getting the immunization. And that's what the rheumatologists here at UNC um, tell their patients and the societies have come out with statements too. They should get, consider getting the vaccine because the risk to develop COVID-19 and complications from COVID-19 including dying or long-term complications from COVID-19 infection are significantly higher than the risk, the low risk or potentially even a rare risk of developing in a reactivation of the immune disorder. Whatever anticoagulant or blood thinner you are on, it's appropriate for you to get the vaccine because you get the flu vaccine once per year and most people don't change their blood thinner dosing. However, in the patient on warfarin or uh, Jantoven, which is the brand name for uh, warfarin, on that blood thinner, the INR, the level of thinness, may fluctuate in people so it's worthwhile to get an iron on maybe five or seven days before you get the shot to make sure your blood is not very, very thin at the time of the shot. The shot is given into the muscle of the deltoid, the big shoulder muscle. So if your blood is very thin due to a very high INR, you may want to hold the warfarin for a few days and let the INR come down to the two to three or maybe even a two to four range and then get the shot. With the the other blood thinners, Ralto, um, Eliquis, Prodaxa, or Cerveza, these oral drugs that you don't need to monitor, you can get the shot even when you're on the blood thinner because your blood is not overly thinned. But I've also told patients, look, if you take the drug typically in the morning, then it's easy enough not to take it that morning because we know occasionally a patient, even not on blood thinners, develops a hematoma, a big bruise in the arm. Not common, but it does occur. And that risk is likely a little bit higher if you're on a blood thinner. So I think it's very reasonable in the morning not to take the dose of the blood thinner of the four I mentioned, and then get the shot and take it afterwards. However, I'm, people are on blood thinners for different reasons, and I don't know what blood thinner you are on, so if you do that, then you should talk to your primary care physician or whoever follows your blood thinner. So typically they use a very small needle and the small needle is called a gauge 25. Um, a slightly larger needle is called a gauge 23 or 22. So it's the numbers go down, yet the size is bigger. It's a little confusing. So the optimal needle size is gauge 25. And that's what I would like if I was on a blood thinner. But a 23 or 22 is very likely also sufficient. But if the 
injection center, the vaccination center has a small needle, that would be preferred. So if you as a patient tell them, I'm on a blood thinner, can I have a gauge 25 needle? That would be the optimal approach. But I would not say, if you don't have a 25, I'm not going to take the vaccination. That would be wrong. You're better off getting the vaccination. There should not be any concern or any modification of the treatment plan. You should just get the vaccine. Number one, the two vaccines we have available in the United States at this point, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, do not increase the risk for blood clots. There's no signal, so people should get it. Secondly, the vaccine that was just halted this week, the Johnson Johnson uh, or Janssen vaccine, has been associated with very rare, unusual clots, and that's why it's been halted. Uh, thirdly, the people who have had the Janssen and Janssen or Johnson vaccine that's been halted, within the last two or four weeks, and let's say four weeks, who develop unusual symptoms, such as significant headache, the worst headache ever, neurological symptoms, like a weakness on one side or the other, speech problems, um, or who develop unusual abdominal symptoms, uh, stomach pain, severe stomach pain, nausea, vomiting, that's out of the blue. They should think, could I have a blood clot around the brain or in the abdomen? that may be associated with the Johnson Johnson vaccine and they should seek medical attention. Um, fourthly, people who have a history of blood clots, either DVT or PE or other blood clots, or who are on a blood thinner, are not at higher risk for developing a recurrence of the blood clot, a new blood clot, if they get one of the two vaccines that we have available. And then lastly, in general, everybody should think about, yes, I should get a vaccine um, and I should get vaccinated. There are very few patients uh, who should not get it. And those are typically the ones who have an allergy to one of the components of the vaccine. But the blood clot issue with the two vaccines we have available in the United States, that should not influence anybody to get the vaccine at this time.